Ultima 5 Warriors of Destiny, released three years after the quest of the Avatar, is a direct continuation of the story of the Avatar. While not exactly the first time a game in the Ultima series is a sequel to the previous game, this marks a point in the series when the stories are becoming more connected instead of being kinda sorta connected, like the first trilogy of games was. Sure, the motivations of the villains in those games were connected to the previous games, but the world and the characters varied wildly between the games. But from this point onwards, the connections between the games become more direct and more uniform. Once more, as you begin the game, you are tasked with creating your character. Just as in Ultima 4, there are no character sheets, but a questionnaire asking you to choose between specific moral choices which define the primary virtue of your main character, which in turn decides the class you will play. This questionnaire is again given by the fortune teller, and within the context of the story, these choices you make are happening prior to the events of Ultima 4, making this a kind of flashback to the questionnaire in the previous game. Another option is to transfer your character from Ultima 4. This gives you a boost in your starting level and stats. Unfortunately, in the GOG versions that I'm playing, getting that to work is a bit of a chore. You need to download a utility that can be used to fix the save files, which can then be used to transfer your character into Ultima 5. Link in the description. From the main menu, you can also view the introduction to the game. After the events of Ultima 4, you, the Avatar, had returned back to Earth, hoping to one day return to Britannia to see all of your friends again. You've taken frequent trips to the Circle of Stones, which acted as your portal into Britannia, but the portal had never returned. Then, one night, as you lie in bed, you see a vision. A vision which solidifies and falls onto your bed. It's an amulet, depicting the symbol of the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom. Feeling like this is a sign, you quickly recover your equipment and your Ankh, and rush to the Circle of Stones. By a sheer act of fate, you open the portal into Britannia using the amulet and the Ankh, and step through. This time, you're back in a familiar land, but something is amiss. Shamino arrives to warn you of danger, and implores you to hurry, but alas, it is too late. Three figures appear out of the darkness of the night and strike a magical blow to your friend, before fleeing the scene as they are faced with your Ankh. Shamina calls these three figures the Shadow Lords, and it is now clear that the hopes of a more peaceful Britannia have been shattered, and the world needs a hero once more. After helping Shamino to the hut of Iolo the Bard, Iolo recants to you what has happened in the world of Britannia since your departure. All seemed well at first. The world was hopeful as an avatar had been found, and people were embracing the philosophy of the virtues, and working together to make their world a better place. With Lord British at the helm, the dungeons were sealed. The Codex of Ultimate Wisdom was magically raised from the bottom of the abyss, so its knowledge would be accessible to those on a true spiritual journey. This was shown to be a mistake, as the immense magical forces required to achieve this feat also caused a great change. The land beneath Britannia was forever morphed into something different. Earthquakes opened new passages, and a vast network of caverns was unearthed. From these new passages, monsters stronger than anything seen before began to roam the lands. To investigate these new passages, Lord British formed a large force and delved deep within one of these passages, but he did not return. Only one person managed to return to the surface, retelling the tale of great beasts and dangers. In the absence of a ruler, the land still needed guidance, and this role was filled by a confidant of Lord British, Lord Blackthorn. During his rule, at first everything seemed to be well, but slowly things started to change. The virtues, still at the core of the new Britannian society, were reinterpreted. No more were the virtues a blueprint for self-improvement, but instead they were codified into law, and breaking the laws was punished. Even your old companions are now outlaws, as they had walked the path of the Avatar with you, and still hold on to the values you learned during Ultima 4. The introduction presents to you a few scenarios that act as a starting point to your journey. What happened to Lord British? Why is Blackthorn corrupting the virtues? Who are the Shadow Lords? 
Another interesting feature involving the intro can be seen before you even enter the main menu, and which can be returned to using the Return to View option, is an animated version of the introduction story that plays in the demo window and showcases the new graphical style of the game. Immediately we can also see the first major change in the game. Whereas the previous games had more of a focus in building the worlds and the main quest you are meant to embark on, Ultima 5 is the first game in the series that starts to shift focus more on personal interactions with the characters and the struggles of the people within the world. For example, you've likely met Shamino and Iolo in multiple previous games, and it's also quite likely that you don't really remember doing so in any other game than Ultima 4, where they were recruitable party members. But in Ultima 5, you are immediately thrust into a scenario where it's made clear that you and the characters have a long history together, and they are starting to get proper personalities. This same theme of character development is also shown in the lore book that came with the game. At the very beginning, the Book of Lore tells the story of Lord British and how he came to arrive in Sosaria the same way you did, via a moon gate from Earth, and how the fates of your companions were intertwined with that of Lord British from his very first moments in this new land. As you begin the game, you find yourself where the introduction left off, at Iolo's hut with Shamino and Iolo in your party. Examining the attributes and inventory of your current party, you can see that the system works basically the same way it did in Ultima 4. Their status view is displayed in the party window at the top of your screen, and you can scroll the pages with the arrow keys. There are though a few additions that are immediately available. First of all, your party now has a pocket watch. As you may expect, you can use the watch to see the exact time in the world, which is a part of a new and important feature in the game the day-night cycle, which affects multiple things in the world including whether certain characters are available to talk to, whether shops are open, and some more magical features of the world. For example, now moon gates are only available at night, and the moon cycles and approximate time of day are shown at the very top of the screen in place of the moon phase display. Other new features shown by examining the inventory are magical scrolls, which contain a single use of a spell, and magic potions that serve several uses you might expect in a role-playing game. How the magic scrolls are displayed also highlights some changes to the magic system. In essence, the magic system is very similar to the one in Ultima 4, with a few additions. First of all, the spells are now identified by words of power, each of which is explained in the lore book. For example, the spell Anzu translates to negate sleep, which can be used to wake a character up, whereas the spell Inzu translates to create sleep, which does the exact opposite. Therefore, identifying the spell scrolls is dependent on two factors. First, understanding the meanings of the words of power, and second, knowing enough about the runic alphabet system to be able to identify the first letter of each word of power. The spells still require reagents to be mixed together for casting, and the mixtures required for each spell can be found in the spellbook. But this time, my largest issue with the magic system in Ultima 4 has been remedied, and you can mix batches of spells instead of having to do them one at a time. Journeying further into Britannia to learn more about the evils plaguing the land is going to be dangerous, especially with one of the characters being nearly dead. Here the manual comes in handy, with a feature that did exist in Ultima 4 but I didn't talk about since I just completely forget about it. Camping. Camping is your primary means of recovering health and magic, as Lord British is now gone and as such is unavailable for his role as a free healer. The amount healed seems to be somewhat random and you are not guaranteed to fully heal during camping. Resting this way is also a good way to pass time, which can be extremely useful especially due to the new day-night cycle, since nights in the game are extremely dark, limiting your visibility severely, necessitating either travelling practically blind or using torches to increase your range of vision. Unfortunately, camping is not necessarily safe and your party can be ambushed by monsters as they are resting. This is why the game gives you an option to leave someone awake to keep guard. Of course, this character will not rest and thus not recover health or magic, but they can wake up the party if an ambush happens, giving you a better chance of defeating the ambushing monsters. If you are ambushed, you are directly thrust into a combat scene, which acts out in the same screen as the camping scene did. This highlights the improvements made to the combat formula. 
The combat scenes can be even more varied and complex than they were before, and there are several other changes and improvements. For example, now the attacks are targeted using a crosshair. This finally allows you not only to attack diagonally, but in every direction that is in the range of the weapon the attacking character is currently using. This is a great addition. As with some weapons, such as halberds, you can attack over obstacles, being able to harm the enemies before they even reach your characters. Your initial party is built to show you another new feature with the combat system, which is the addition of several equipment slots, allowing you to equip weapons in both hands for multiple attacks, or wear helmets, shields, accessories and such. Equipment also has weight, and the maximum amount a character can wear at once is dependent on the strength attribute of that character. The experience gain works just as it did before. It is not shared, but experience is gained by the character that strikes the final blow to an enemy. This, I think, is one of the worst parts of the game, especially since it felt like compared to the previous games, this one required the most grinding to reach higher levels. And reaching those is practically a requirement since health gained by level is much smaller than previously, while the enemies felt more strong. Another new feature is that the loot is dropped in the combat scene instead of being found as a chest after the battle in the overworld view. This also means that combat does not automatically end, but you must move your party out of the combat scene manually. But since chests are considered a physical object, they can be used as cover from the other enemies still remaining in the combat scene, allowing the player to funnel enemies to certain kill zones, for example. A problem the player will face when entering the world of Britannia is figuring out where they even are. This is slightly easier if you're already familiar with the world of Ultima 4, as the world of Britannia in Ultima 5 is, while not exactly identical, extremely similar, with towns and the general layout of the landmasses being easily recognizable. Thus, the large forest you find yourself in is probably a good clue to your approximate whereabouts. Whereas for the new player, the process of starting to learn about Britannia is made slightly easier by having the location designed to naturally guide you towards certain landmarks. For example, going north will lead you to a dead end, and if you go west you will stumble upon a road you can follow to two settlements. If you go east, you will see a signpost that can be used with a map to find your approximate location. Going south will lead you to a clearing, which leads towards the capital city area, and going west leads to the coast, forcing you either north towards the road or south towards the capital. Whichever settlement you may find first, that is where the main part of the game begins. Just as in Ultima 4, the key component of the game is talking to as many people as possible to find out what to do and where. The talking system returns mostly unchanged, and you are expected to learn keywords you can use to find out more information. For example, based on the introduction segment, you can immediately guess that talking to people about Blackthorn or Lord British will reveal to you information not only about what you're meant to do in the game, but about what has happened in Britannia during your absence. And there is a lot to talk about. Since the game is also meant to be accessible to new players, many things you can learn are things you are familiar with if you played Ultima 4. You can get a crash course on the virtues, their connections, and there are small quests related to once more learning about the mantras for each of the virtues. And since the game is also made with returning players in mind, you can skip these conversations completely if you already know about the virtues and their respective mantras. Traveling the world and talking to people is also the way to find new companions to join your party, which is now limited to six characters. Most of the people you recruit are returning characters, but in the twisted world of Ultima 5, not every recruitable character is going to be your friend for long. Inns found on most major cities can be used to change characters in your party. Trying to learn more about the fate of Lord British, you eventually hear rumors about the Resistance, a group of people who remained loyal to the Crown, fighting in the shadows against the reign of Blackthorn. Figuring out that allying yourself with this Resistance is probably a good idea, you journey across the land to find their hidden fortress. This is not an easy task to accomplish, since their fortress is located on a mountain that dominates a lonely island in the ocean. Reaching this fortress gives an opportunity to examine some of the improvements and additions in Ultima 5. As mentioned with the potions and scrolls, now the game has several more usable items than in the previous games, one of which is a grappling hook that can be used to climb mountains and reach plot important areas. Many of these objects can be found through quests that take you around the world.
This adds a great amount of depth to the world of the game, and the amount of things to do and find out not only makes the exploration feel rewarding, but it keeps the player more engaged as you never know what you may find when you reach the next settlement. Different transportation methods also return. For example, you can once more buy horses to travel the world slightly faster, and the ships also return. This time, though, you can purchase them, instead of having to wait for a pirate ship to spawn for you to commandeer. Other than that, these work almost identically to those in Ultima 4, but there is one major addition to the ships. The expanded tile set of Ultima 5 has allowed the overworld map to have more landscape features. We've already seen things like roads that sometimes connect major settlements, and more detailed rivers and such. And even the oceans now have a few different types of tiles. Previously, oceans had two sets of functional tiles, ones you can sail on and shallows you cannot. These return in Ultima 5 and there's now also a tile for deep ocean. The purpose of these is to work with a new addition to the ships, the skiff. Each ship now has one that you can deploy, and you have to, since frigates still cannot sail in the shallow water, but the skiff can pass these tiles. You also end up in a skiff if your frigate is destroyed in battle, but this can be very dangerous, especially due to the deep ocean tiles, which the skiffs are not equipped to travel, causing constant damage to your party while on those tiles. Another new addition to the transportation methods is a hidden magic carpet. Finding it requires you to not only find out it exists, but also the exploration of indoor areas. This is also much more of a feature in the game thanks to the expanded tile set. Buildings now look more lived in. There can be torches, furniture, and many other kinds of objects in rooms now, instead of just blocks that you have to imagine as furniture. Some of these are surprisingly interactable for their time. For example, you can sit on chairs and sleep in beds, though if the owner of the bed wants to use it, they will just unceremoniously throw you out of it. Even the mirrors have a secondary state that shows your character when directly in front of it. This also links to the day-night cycle of the game, as objects that emit light in the game world dynamically illuminate the landscape. The interactivity does not stop there, as you also have a look function which can be used to gain more information from objects, such as reading signposts, and the search function which is now targeted that can be used to look for hidden objects in other objects and reveal hidden passages. The tile set also shows you whether doors are unlocked, locked, or magically locked, each of which requires the player to perform a different action to open them. A new push function also allows the player to move some objects in the world, which can be used to do things like reach otherwise unreachable passages, block the passage of enemies, or sometimes to come up with alternative solutions to problems. Once you've reached the base of the Resistance, you are given one of the main quests of the game, finding the crown jewels of Lord British, three magical items that have either been stolen or lost as a result of his disappearance in the Underworld, the crown which is told to negate the use of magic by the wearer's foes, the scepter which has the power to negate magical fields, and the amulet which has the power of the moon gates within it. In addition to finding the crown jewels of Lord British, another line of questioning that was introduced at the very beginning is to learn more about the three mysterious Shadow Lords and how to rid the world of their influence. As you talk to people, it is made clear that these entities are the true reason why the world is as it is, that they have corrupted Lord Blackthorn and his interpretation of the virtues, creating an oppressive world where neighbors spy on each other and people are constantly afraid. The Shadow Lords are also a clever way to explore the idea that sometimes good deeds may have far-reaching and unseen results, as it is revealed that in a sense the existence of the Shadow Lords is in part your doing. The Shadow Lords draw their power and evil nature from three shards of Mundane's Gem of Immortality, which you shattered long ago during your quest to free Cesaria from his evil grasp. Many of the calamities and the current plight is a direct result of that action, and the act of shattering the gem was thus not enough to rid the world of that evil. So to destroy the Shadow Lords, you must fix your past mistake, and find out how to destroy the shards of the Gem of Immortality once and for all. 
Unlike in many other games, including the previous Ultimas, the Shadow Lords are not a passive force in the game. This is partially due to criticisms Richard Garriott had about the role-playing games, including his own ones, where you are told to go defeat a great evil, but instead end up doing more harm to the world by stealing and murdering than you ever see the supposed evil of the game do. This kind of a passive evil that just waits inside their impenetrable fortress for the hero to arrive and kill them was something he wanted to move away from. Thus, not only is the world full of the agents of Blackthorn actively trying to find the resistance, but the Shadow Lords themselves are roaming the land, occasionally arriving at one of the settlements and distorting the people within. Depending on which Shadow Lord is in the city, the citizens may become hostile, deceptive or thieving. This is because you eventually find out that the Shadow Lords are a representation of the antithesis of the Three Principles. Instead of truth, love and courage, the Shadow Lords embody falsehood, hatred and cowardice. Not only that, the Shadow Lords themselves can find you and attack you if you decide to remain in a city where a Shadow Lord is spreading their influence. Especially at the start, this would not be a terribly good idea, as if a Shadow Lord makes contact with you, they will pull you into another dimension where you are unable to flee from and have to fight them. This is most likely to result in the death of your party, as without appropriate defenses, you are easy prey to the powerful Shadow Lords. Once more though, death is not the end, but it is far more punishing than it was previously. This time, each death also removes a portion of your gained experience, which can be very daunting considering the increased need for experience and the speed at which you are able to gain it. How much is removed depends on a feature that's adjacent to the virtue system from Ultima 4, Karma, which can be seen as a combination of all the virtues from the previous game. The higher your Karma, the less experience you will lose whenever you die. This is a good way to incentivize the player to still act like a good person and refrain from deception, theft and murder. Leveling up works basically the same as previously. Once you have enough experience, Lord British increases the level of the character, which in turn increases the maximum health pool of that character. You may now be asking, but how can Lord British do that? Isn't the game about finding him? Well, yes. You are correct, and this is another part that I'm not the biggest fan of, as this time the opportunity to level up is random. Every time you sleep, there is a chance that Lord British appears as an apparition in your camp to automatically heal and level up your party. This, as you may guess, can get kind of annoying, and sometimes getting him to spawn may take quite a long time. Raising attributes is no longer about finding orbs in dungeons, but instead they raise as you level and via quests from the shrines. The shrines of each virtue still exist in the world and as in Ultima 4 can be used to meditate at if you know the appropriate mantra. Doing so will initiate a quest that will also lead you to the current home of the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom. Once completing this pilgrimage and returning to the shrine, the attribute or attributes linked to that virtue are slightly raised. The dungeons also return, and in many ways work as they did before, but once more, they are visually more appealing. They are also used to reach different parts of the underworld, where your search for the shards leads you. Unfortunately, as mentioned in the introduction, the dungeons have been sealed and can only be opened by uttering the appropriate word of power linked to that specific dungeon. These words are only known by the members of Lord British's Great Council, who were responsible for sealing the dungeons in the first place. And to learn them, you must lead your party around the world in search of these people, some of which are in hiding or imprisoned, as everyone loyal to Lord British is an outlaw in a world ruled by Blackthorn. Another part of the game also expects you to betray one of these council members, so the party can gain access to Lord Blackthorn's castle to acquire one of the magical relics of Lord British. This, in addition to the fascistic way Blackthorn interprets the virtues, is one part where the player is made to think whether following the virtues religiously is even possible, and perhaps sometimes you have to bend your morals to reach a greater good. Yes, it's perhaps not just to sacrifice someone else, nor is it honest to lie about being on the side of Blackthorn, but what if it's the only way to rid the world of an even greater evil? Is a literal adherence to the virtues the correct path to take then, if it leads to untold suffering in the hands of a despot? 
If you do not do this and still enter the castle of Blackthorn, it's more than likely that the party will be caught and imprisoned. This leads to an interesting scene that has rarely been replicated in a video game, where Blackthorn tries to convince you to reveal the mantra of a virtue. For the most part, he doesn't talk like a villain here, but comes off more as a misled person who really admires you and your adherence to the virtues. Of course, knowing about the influence of the Shadow Lords, you know this is not the current reality, so the desire to resist giving one of the mantras is completely understandable. Blackthorn then threatens to kill one of your companions if you do not do as he says. But whether you cooperate or not, he will follow through and a contraption slices one of your companions in half. If this happens, no amount of resurrection spells will bring that companion back, but they are gone forever. I'd really like it if more games did things like this, where your choices can lead to the final death of a companion, even when you act in a way that you think is the right thing to do. Giving Blackthorn a mantra will still cost you a companion, and the shrine you gave the mantra to will be destroyed. And to restore it, you must complete another pilgrimage quest. After scouring the world for the crown jewels, even assaulting the lair of the Shadow Lords for one of them, the one place left to explore is the Underworld, which is basically a second overworld map available for exploration, kinda like Ambrosia was in Ultima 3, but much larger and more difficult to explore. To be able to find everything you need from the Underworld, including the three shards of the Gem of Immortality and the mystic weapons which return, the player must use several tools and magics without which exploring the entire Underworld is impossible. The final parts of the main quest lead you to learn how to exercise the Shadow Lords and to delve even deeper into the Underworld to rescue Lord British from the final dungeon, Doom. This acts similarly as the Abyss did in Ultima 4, just without the quizzes, as the final challenge of endurance and preparation for the player. Doom is long and difficult, and death lurks behind every corner, sometimes even behind a wall, which may or may not work to your advantage. Reaching the very bottom, you find Lord British trapped in a mirror, and you're stuck, since you're missing a vital item, which, up until this point, has not been hinted at well. A feature that became a sort of a running gag in the Ultima series is a character called Smith, the talking horse, who could also be found in Ultima 4, but had really nothing to say. He tends to give you hints about the previous game and acts a sort of cheeky apology from the developers type of character. For example, in this game, Smith reveals to you the final word needed to complete Ultima 4, Infinity, while apologizing that he was meant to give you hints about it earlier. Why mention it now? Well, because another set of clues that was left out of the game. To rescue Lord British, you need not only his crown jewels, but a sandalwood box he keeps in a hidden room within his bedchamber. There's really only one clue about it in the game that can easily be missed by choosing the wrong options when talking to Sadduj, a hidden agent of Blackthorn in Castle British. Doing it all again, this time with the box with you, you rescue Lord British and return to the surface using the contents of the sandalwood box. Lord British is restored to the throne and Blackthorn is exiled into the unknown, perhaps never to be seen again. Ultima 5 is in many ways a significant improvement over Ultima 4. While I do have some issues with the game, mostly with the leveling up requiring massive amounts of grinding, for the most part I consider this game to be one of the best RPG experiences I've had. The world building is fantastic, helped by the world staying consistent from the previous game and building upon what had already been laid down, making it truly feel like returning to a world you're familiar with making all of the differences and corruptions by the Shadow Lords seem even more striking. Little details like seeing Lord Blackthorn's castle being built on the landmass that was created from the volcanoes that mundane skull agitated in the sea during Ultima 4 is a masterpiece of symbolism that makes sense if you've played the previous game. How even after the removal of the skull, the Shadow Lords clearly were attracted towards the evil energy that mundane skull radiated everywhere around it. On a technical level, Ultima 5 is much more advanced than the earlier games. The addition of the day-night cycle, which includes daily schedules for the NPCs, and a dynamic lighting system that works not only with the light emitted by the player, but by other objects in the game world. 
The graphics of the game are much more advanced with a larger tile set and more animations, and sprites that take a better advantage of the 16 color palette. The combat system feels much better than before, even though the base functionality is basically the same. Still turn-based where you move using the arrow keys, but the aiming system added to the attacks and the selection rectangle denoting which character you're currently controlling make a surprisingly large difference to the fighting. The story itself is still very clever, and I appreciate whenever a storyteller does something like what Ultima 5 did, playing expertly with the player's knowledge and expectations. Since the world is meant to seem familiar to accentuate the differences, it also accentuates the message of how fundamentalistic belief in your philosophy can be easily twisted into something evil, even if you think that the root of it is ultimately good. How those with good intentions can be mistaken and misled and end up doing a lot of harm while still following the same philosophy you do, just by having a very different interpretation of some of its fundamental features. If Ultima 4 made me appreciate the series, Ultima 5 made me fall in love with it. Anyway, that is it for this time, and I'd like to thank everyone who's been watching these videos, sharing and commenting, watching the streams, and supporting this weird creative journey I'm on on Ko-fi. Thank you. But, until the next time, when we'll have a look at Ultima 6. Fintrovert, signing out.